Moving on through the non-systems domain on the FSBPT's content outline, we'll be talking about prosthetic devices that and how it relates to physical therapy. So with prosthetic devices, again, if you can say it 10 times fast, that's uh, maybe something that intimidates a lot of people. So I wanted to spend some time talking about the basics of prosthetic prescription when it comes to physical therapy and how we as physical therapists, as a, as a field of physical therapy, deal with individuals with prosthetic devices. So prosthetic devices uh, typically, well, categorically used to replace or assist with an amputated limb. Um, most, common, most commonly, we're dealing with individuals with some sort of vascular disease, trauma, or some sort of malignancy. Uh, and the, the reason I put that is, is just to maintain or keep in mind that almost always we have individuals with some sort of comorbidity in addition to the prosthesis and the residual limb that we're working with. Uh, maybe in the case of trauma, it could be very isolated, but almost always with some sort of vascular disease or malignancy, there is something else going on too. So just keep that in mind when you're working with individuals with some sort of prosthetic device. You need to make sure that you're taking good care of that residual limb, and then obviously as a field of physical therapy, you're trying to maximize function. So the common lower extremity amputations, just want to talk briefly about these. So this is listed kind of from bottom to the top. The transmetatarsal, obviously going right through the metatarsals. The Liz Franck, where you maintain or you spare the uh, tarsal bones. The show part, where you take everything except for the talus and calcaneus. And then the Symes, Symes amputation is where you get all the way through the malleoli, basically a, a ankle disarticulation. But then they typically, in surgery, they maintain that calcaneal uh, fat pad, and so they bring the fat pad back up and attach it at the bottom, or the, pro, the distal end of the tibia. So that's what a Symes amputation is. Then we have our classic transtibial or below knee amputation. We could also have a knee disarticulation. It's not very common anymore. They like to do one or the other, do either transtibial or transfemoral, but you could also have a hip disarticulation as well. So there's multiple levels. Again, it totally depends on the, with someone with vascular insufficiency, you'll be talking about the degree of vascular insufficiency and ischemic tissue death to determine how low you go with your amputation. Not that we're performing any of the amputations, but that's a, kind of the determining factor that goes into the amputation. I'll tell you that very they do not do this one very commonly, the knee disarticulation, because they like to have the lever arm. So if you disarticulate the knee, where are you going to put the prosthetic knee joint? That's the question. So if the knee, if you've dis, disarticulated and you have this, just this distal end of your femur, you don't really have a good place to put the knee joint. So that's why they typically come up here to do a transfemoral if they're going to do anything because then you have space to put the socket and a knee joint and make it more functional. That's the idea. All right, lower extremity prostheses. You have uh, basically the lower you go, the more stable and more active the individual is. This is what would be a Symes prosthetic. Again, like I described with the Symes, they cut here. So if we put Symes amputation, they cut here at the malleoli, but maintain the fatty pad of the calcaneus. They basically just reposition that to the distal end of the tibia. And so therefore, the person is able to bear weight, full weight, through that calcaneal fat pad. And you know, typically, it's just basically a foot. You have a foot attached onto the end of their distal tibia. Um, you can bear weight really pretty well. You just have to, to modify the foot to fit your needs specifically. So that's the Symes prosthesis. Uh, usually pretty straightforward. You also have these partial foot prostheses. Again, if we come back, to, you can have basically a shoe with a kind of the prosthetic toes in them or a partial shoe. That's the idea with a transmetatarsal prosthesis is that it's typically just the forefoot and is, in essence, created to mimic what part was amputated. That's the idea. So that's the Symes prosthetic. 
Uh, when it comes to kind of getting into our more common prostheses, we have a lot of transtibial amputees that, that we deal with on a regular basis. And so with a transtibial or a below knee amputation, the goal is to replace the shank and foot mechanism without placing a lot of load on the residual limb. Because as you'll discover in physical therapy that the residual limb, the leftover, the stump, the, the residual limb, that distal tibia, is not very tolerant to pressure. So thus, it behooves us to create a socket that takes the pressure and places on a, it on pressure tolerant areas and takes it away from pressure sensitive areas. So the most common one, this is often called a patellar tendon bearing socket or PTB socket, where you put a lot of pressure and emphasis on that patellar tendon. It's soft, you're not gonna get any sort of, well, I guess you could, you could never say never, but it tolerates pressure really quite well. You're trying to hit that medial and lateral tibia, kind of the down below the condyles, you're in, encapsulating and circling the tibia. If the tibial plateau looks something like this, as it comes down, your goal with the patellar tendon bearing, or yeah, with your transtibial prosthesis is to get the pressure here on the shaft and um, yeah, basically away from the bony prominence, kind of encapsulate the tibial shaft there. Same thing with the fibula. You wanna hit the shaft and the neck. You don't wanna hit the head. If you hit the fibular head, that's a very sharp bony prominence. Uh, it's gonna be very uncomfortable. Same thing with the tibial crest. So right here down the middle. Here, let me see if I can change my ink color. So down the middle, you don't want to get pressure here on the tibial crest or the tibial tubercle. These are bad news. Again, bony prominences you don't want to hit. Fibular head you don't want to hit. The condyles up here you don't want to hit. Don't want to hit any of those areas. You want to get your pressure on nice wide, um, yeah, nice wide pressure tolerant areas. That's the idea. Change my color back. All right, so with a transfemoral prosthesis, a very similar principle here. This is also called an above knee amputation. You want to move the pressure to the more tolerant areas and you want to take it off of the residual limb. Because as you can imagine with the residual limb, you know, you have what's left over the limb. Inside that limb, you have the femur that comes down typically as they try to, to bevel it off to make it not sharp, but you almost always have a sharp femur inside of there. And that's very sensitive to pressure. And so you want to take the pressure away from that and you move all the pressure you can to the gluteal musculature, both on the, on the well, especially on the back, a bit on the side, but not quite so much on the medial side because you don't want to get up into the groin area. Stay away from the perineum uh, and the pubic symphysis, obviously. And um, so avoid the medial, the high medial wall and try to put most of it through the lateral walls, the low medial wall, and the posterior wall on the gluteals. Again, avoiding your bony prominences as much as possible. Okay, so starting from the ground up, every one of, well, I, I should dare, I dare say most from Symes up. So Symes, transtibial, transfemoral, and hip disarticulation, they all have to have some sort of foot prosthesis. And so the most common one, and that's I'm all, all I'm gonna really spend time on is the most common one is what's called the solid ankle cushion heel foot prosthesis or a SAC heel. In essence, what you have is you have a solid keel. So that's the part that comes down right here. It's basically, in this case, this was made of stainless steel or some other lightweight material. Well, stainless steel is not that lightweight. So you could use, make it out of wood, aluminum, anything that's, again, the lighter, probably the better. It creates a rigid interior of the foot. You have these springy, toe mechanisms. In essence, what happens is that as you pr progress through the gait cycle, those toes can actually um, create energy storage. They'll store the energy and give you a little bit of spring and push as you go through terminal stance and into the swing phase. And the biggest thing is here on the back, they have what's called a cushion heel. So in this guy, 
he actually has this foot covering. It's just a silicone sheath covering what's inside. But there's a cushioned heel on the back of here. So that cushioned heel is a shock absorber that as the person strikes the ground, that heel takes a lot of the, the stress that would normally be translated through the tissues. It absorbs a lot of the stress so you don't get a big jolt every time you hit the ground. So this is the most common one is a solid ankle cushion heel. Now the cushioning can be either too firm, too soft, or just right, kind of a Goldilocks principle. I'll talk a little bit about that coming up, but in essence, the cushioning can be adjusted, the length can be adjusted, the degrees, the angle, the positioning, everything can be adjusted. So the idea is just to get optimal, the optimal gait cycle with your solid ankle cushion heel. A couple of the other ones that are available is you can also have what's called a leaf spring foot. It looks a little bit like this. Uh, basically, you just have a giant leaf spring. and it, Well, the, these are multi-axial multi feet. But a leaf spring basically just has your residual limb that comes down, and then you hook on to a, a giant spring. That, that's about it. You've seen these in the Olympics. You know, people will run. They have a lot of energy storage here. Uh, they don't allow for a lot of multi-axial uh, motion, so the person does have to be a pretty stable person to be able to use this. Same thing for, for multi-axis feet. Most, common, most commonly, we have just a single axis, but a multi-axis feet, multi-axis foot, excuse me, would allow you to adapt to more uneven surfaces, but generally would obviously require more maintenance because there's more degrees of freedom in that ankle. So the more degrees of freedom you have, the more stability the patient has to provide themselves. All right, so that's a little bit about the foot. Now I want to talk about the shank. So this is what's called the shank. It's this, me almost always, it's some sort of metal um, adjustable shank to replace the lower leg. Uh, there's two different types. Types There's called an exoskeletal. That's just one that looks like the leg. It's, it's tinted to the same color and shape and size of your anatomical limb versus the endoskeletal. This is by far the most common. And this is what's pictured here is an endoskeletal shank. What happens with the endoskeletal shank is that it's highly adjustable. Although it might look a little funny, it's extremely useful when a person is, uh, obviously with something that has to be custom made, you need to get it right the first time. But with this adjustable endoskeleton, you can play with it, uh, see what's wrong, fix it and basically give you a lot more degree, a lot more freedom in uh, getting the person ready to walk or getting them through their ambulation. So that's the most common is that endoskeletal shank. All right, the knee joint. So now we've moved above the transtibial amputations, and now we're talking about transfemoral amputations, which require then some sort of knee joint or some sort of knee replacement joint to, uh, to replicate gait. So they do make the single axis knees. The difficulty with single axis is it doesn't replicate the, you know, just a pure hinge. It doesn't replicate, replicate anatom the anatomical uh, motion of the knee. Rather, most go for a polycentric knee, and that's what's pictured here, is it's kind of this four-point hinge pattern that creates, it travels backward as it goes down, and so it just, it mimics a knee joint, the shape of the condyles on the tibial plateau. It, it uh, s simulates that quite a bit. Then you have what's something called friction. So knee rotation friction. This is some way that prevents the knee from just collapsing on itself. You know, if you just have a pure hinge mechanism, it would just fall over. So almost always there's some sort of friction device. So it could be mechanical uh, so if you just, a lot of times they just put rubber bands, different size, I mean, they're fancy rubber bands, but fancy rubber bands that prevent knee flexion or slow it down or they're an extension assist. Uh, there's also hydraulic types. They have a piston inside of them. Again, getting more expensive and more bulky, but they, you know, the hydraulic does allow you to control the motion with a steady degree of resistance all the way through. And then they, they go so far as to have these uh, electronic computer chip knee joints that they detect what you're doing and they try to mimic it so that you can sit down, stand up, and have good knee control throughout. And a lot of times, you, so when you're going through the gait cycle, as you go forward through terminal stance and begin the swing phase, you have to extend the knee to full, you know, full knee extension. 
So a lot of times there's some sort of extension aid too. So it's not just friction, but it's also an aid. So a lot of times they have both those. So there's friction or the, the hydraulic piston that prevents it from flexing fast and then some sort of spring-loaded device that shoots it forward again as soon as you unload it. And then sometimes, like in this person's case, they had a knee extension lock. What you can see here is that uh, this device comes down and actually, you know, when the person comes to full upright, the knee locks in place. And then in order to sit down, the person had to pulls, has to pull this handle. And by pulling the handle, it unlocks the knee and allows the person to sit down. All right, so now to the real fun, suspension devices. So there's, there's a couple of different ways to suspend. You can do something called suction or full suction. Uh, well, I guess total or partial suction. What I mean by that is that the whole, the whole uh, socket becomes a big vacuum and it has a pump on it. You stick your leg in there, you have to have a good seal around the top and you can actually suck the leg in and you know the pressure keeps it from falling off. That's pretty common. Uh, one of the other most common ones is something called a, a silicone cuff. And that's what I'm displaying here, this sheath basically. So this sheath, it's made of a silicone rubber. It creates a bit of a, you know, it won't slide down because it is made of a rubberized material. And so therefore it creates kind of that suction at the bottom. It's not a full suction like what we were talking about here where the whole socket is vacuum or pressurized, depressurized, I guess. This is just a, a silicone sleeve that's very sticky, you know, like silicone is. And then it has a shuttle pin lock or shuttle lock pin at the bottom that this shuttle lock pin inserts into the prosthetic socket and locks in place. And in order to remove it, you have to pull a pin to unlock the shuttle lock, to unlock the shuttle lock. The other one is what's called a Silesian or Silesian belt. In essence, it's just a belt that goes around your hips and comes up, uh, just, yeah, holds it up at the hip level. Most people opt for the suction or the some sort of cuff or sheath. That seems to be the most common one. But you can also have what's called a thigh corset. A corset, you know, a corset obviously just being something that comes around the thigh and it tightens down on the thigh. And so it'll be held up by the thigh rather than coming up to the hip with the Silesian belt. And then brims, another way to do it is with a brim. What happens is that if you have the socket, if the socket looks something like this, comes down and you have the limb on the bottom, you basically put a brim around the top here. This obviously only works when you have, if you can do this above the femoral condyles. And in essence, you take a device, basically this um, brim material, and you stuff it in between your leg and the... Uh, the brim or the top of the socket. And so by so doing, the socket then is not so apt to fall down. Again, there's all different kinds and types. This is probably the most common one that I've seen, that I've seen and most people like this one. The disadvantage with the silicone sheath is as you can imagine, if it's very hot or humid or you get any moisture inside there, it just, you get skin breakdown pretty fast. So you have, it's kind of a catch-22. You can either have it yeah, you can't have it both ways. All right, a few considerations when you're considering a prosthesis. Just recognize that you will almost categorically have to do some sort of minor adjustment as the brace, or not, not as a brace, as the prosthesis ages. So the hinges degrade, the socket gets a little bit looser. Almost always you have to have some sort of minor adjustment or maybe just the screws come loose you have to tighten them back up again, keep it clean and dry. And then this is the big one, is that your residual limb will change sizes over the course of a couple of years after the amputation. So recognize that sometimes the socket will be getting smaller. Sometimes it will get bigger if there's some sort of other, if there's some other condition or problem that keeps showing up where you get swelling in the leg. There's just a lot of things to consider with prosthesis. And I don't claim to be any grand expert on them. But the good news is, is that for the test, you have to be just this entral, entry level, entry level awareness level of your prosthesis. So that's a good news there. All right, post amputation care. Always start with a detailed inspection history and social considerations. Um, just again, you want to see what they were like before the amputation, what you predict they will be like after the amputation. 
plus what the patient wants to be like after the amputation, always check skin integrity. If that's one thing to drive home here, check skin integrity. Always double check skin integrity. Just because you'd hate to have an ulcer or some sort of breakdown on the residual limb, which would end up being catastrophic for your gait training and the whole process. Volume changes, uh, they can be pretty dramatic at times. And then always assess static and dynamic fit. What I mean by that is that as the person is standing, does it fit well, is it nice and tight? But then watch it as they walk so that, you know, is it, is it pistoning up and down? Is it loose? Is it too tight? Anyway, you can see a dynamic. You need to assess both the, the static and the dynamic fit. All right, so now to talk about a few of the common gait deviations that show up with a, uh, with a trans. We're going to talk first about transtibial gait deviations. So transtibial, again, that's a below knee amputation. Some of the most common ones to show up are excessive knee flexion during early stance. So as a person strikes the ground, you have excessive knee flexion. So if this is the the target or the the limb we're talking about, as they strike the ground, they go into excessive knee flexion. The way that works is that, you know, moving to my slide here, that as you strike, if your foot is, or basically, you know, this is just for exaggeration's sake, but as, as a person walks, if the, if the prosthesis is placed too far anteriorly on the foot, it creates a much larger lever arm for the heel. So that's our heel lever arm. So as you strike the ground, it's going to pull the whole thing forward very quickly. And by pulling the whole thing forward, you have this, basically this knee flexion moment, which causes the knee to flex too quickly. That's the idea when it comes to excessive knee flexion during early stance. This can also happen if the heel cushion, so redrawing our similar guy here, if our heel cushion, you know, if this is our foot, so if we're positioned properly, but the heel cushion is too firm, if it's too firm, then the same thing happens. You have struck the ground, but then no shock is absorbed, so you transition immediately into the mid stance or it levers the foot forward and you get this excessive knee flexion that occurs with too firm of a, a cushioned heel. All right, that's the other way. Sorry, wrong way. Early stance, so excessive knee flexion during early stance. So too little knee flexion during early stance comes from the exact opposite. If we were to talk about, here, let me shift colors here. Try to use my colors a little bit better. So as you are striking the ground, if your foot is positioned too far posteriorly, then what happens is you don't, basically there's no lever arm here to bring the foot down into plantar flexion. And so because your center of gravity is up here, so your center of gravity is up here, it's traveling forward, you know, as you're walking. In essence, that'll create an extension moment around the knee. So if this is our knee joint, it creates an extension moment around the knee because the center of gravity, I mean, you can see how if this part, if your femur starts moving forward while you have a fixed tibia, that'll create an extension moment. And so therefore you have too little knee flexion. That's what we're talking about there, too little knee flexion during early stance. The other thing is if you have too soft of a cushion, and so back to this, if it was too firm, it levers you forward too fast. If it's too soft, it doesn't lever you forward enough. And so you get the same thing that happens up here, that as you strike the ground, it's too soft. It spends way too much time absorbing the shock, and you have too little knee flexion that occurs during the uh, during early stance. Now, obviously, weak quadriceps can affect both of those. Uh, with weak quads, In the first example, with excessive knee flexion, uh, you can just imagine that as the knee is flexing too much, um, basically what happens is that your quad is not able to control the knee flexion, and so you just collapse. The other thing seems kind of counterintuitive, but weak quads can also cause too little knee flexion, and the reason is that a person tends to lean too far forward forward 
When you lean too far forward during gait, that's similar to a quadricep gait pattern. So basically, what happens is as a person is standing and striking the ground, so if this is normal versus a forward flexed posture, what you're trying to do with the forward flexed posture if you have weak quadriceps is by moving your center of gravity ahead of the axis of rotation, so moving that ahead of the axis of rotation, it creates this extension moment around the knee. And so therefore, if you have weak quads, you can also have too little knee flexion. So weak quads, that's the nice part is you only have to remember one thing, but weak quads can cause excessive knee flexion because you collapse or too little knee flexion because you're leaning forward. All right, so during the late stance phase, late stance phase of gait, so what happens is, is, so here, let me, I'm going to go ahead and clear off all my slide there. Okay, so during the late stance phase of gait, as we come down, late stance phase means that your heel is just starting to come off and you're about to strike with the other limb. <laughs> That's a terrible drawing. Let me start over, folks. I do not claim to be any great artist, but I will do my very best. So during the last bit of gait, what happens is during the terminal stance phase, your heel starts to come off and you get ready for the swing phase. And your other limb is just about to strike up here. So if this is the limb we're talking about, if this is our prosthetic limb, what happens is if the if you have early knee flexion or too much knee flexion, what happens is if the heel is too high, I mean, that makes sense. If the heel is too high, then you'll go into plantar flexion too fast. That's the idea there. So if the socket is too far anteriorly during that late phase of gait, basically what happens is that it allows the whole thing to roll forward a lot easier and so you get that early knee flexion. That's the idea there. So delayed knee flexion, this would be too low of a heel. So if you had a foot that was dorsiflexed uh, too far, so as a person is walking and about to strike the ground again, um, basically if you're too far dorsiflexed, that can also cause it. Or if the socket is too far posterior, again, you're not going to roll forward as quickly. You want to have the socket at just the right, just the right uh, place. Because if it's too far posterior, it's, you're not going to roll up and bend your knee fast enough. It's too far anterior, you're going to roll and bend your knee too early. Moving on now to the transfemoral gait deviations. And again, just to point out, we're talking about transfemoral gait deviations. I'm going to talk about the most common ones. First one is an abducted uh, position during the stance phase. So as you're standing on it, the foot, the leg is out or abducted a bit. This is most commonly caused by that sharp or high medial wall. That's probably the biggest thing to watch for because it's very uncomfortable when it gets into the groin area. The next most common one is that lateral trunk bending towards your prosthesis. And that's most commonly caused by a short prosthesis. So the prosthesis is too low and you have to lean, leaning towards that prosthesis to prosthetic device or you have a sharp or a high medial wall. Again, the same diff that What's happening is you're leaning towards it so that it takes the pressure off of the medial wall or the medial groin area. It takes the pressure off. Forward trunk flexion. We talked a little bit about this. If you have someone that has a forward trunk posture during the stance phase, what happens, what they're trying to do is to move their center of gravity. You're trying to move that ahead of the axis of rotation of the knee joint. By so doing, it creates an extension moment around the knee and it helps keep the knee stabilized. So that's what's happening when you have a forward trunk, forward trunk flexion. A lordotic posture, this again, this can occur if the you have inadequate hip or knee flexion. Basically what happens is your hip is stuck in a flexed position and so when you try to stand up on it, it creates an anterior pelvic tilt which increases the lordotic posture. That's probably the most common thing is that you have a hip flexion contracture, which is one of the primary things you manage after someone has had a transfemoral amputation. So during the swing phase of gait, what you can have happen is circumduction. So circumduction, uh, these ones you can see here probably are most common ones 
are circumduction, vaulting, and, and whips. But the circumduction and the vaulting and hip hiking occur almost exactly for the same reasons. If the prosthesis is too long, does that make sense? You have to circumduct to clear the prosthesis. If your knee is locked or the joint of the knee is locked, that creates a functionally longer leg, and so therefore it's harder to clear. Or if you have too loose or... So, so inadequate, inadequate suspension or too loose of a socket or too small of a socket. Now, the reason is because if this is your socket, if you're too loose on your socket, then what happens is that as you put the limb in here, let me change my ink color, Let's see if I can. As I place the limb into the socket and it's too little, what will happen is it'll, it will... As soon as I take weight off of it, the whole thing will slop downwards. As soon as you're in the swing phase, the whole thing will basically fall off halfway, creating a longer leg. Or the other thing that happens is if you have too big of a thigh coming in, so you've got thunder thigh coming in and it's too small, what happens is it won't fit. It won't get all the way to the bottom of the socket. And so you get the same thing. You have this functionally longer leg is what I call it. Functionally longer leg from both a too small of a socket and too large or too loose of a socket. That's the idea there. Uh, the whips, medial and lateral whips, uh, these, these just happen when you have a misaligned foot or a knee. And so as you're walking quickly, as your, foot, your heel comes off the ground, your heel will whip either to the medial side, lateral side or the medial side. That's what's called a whip. Um, a high heel rise, when you have an inadequate knee unit friction, what that means, every knee has to have some sort of friction device to prevent it from moving too fast. But if your heel is coming up or jer jerking up too quickly, it's because you don't have enough friction at the knee joint. And then the same thing as you're swinging the foot forward, you have what's called, you can have what's called a terminal impact or where the knee just basically flips all the way to its extension. And you get this is impact or the you know a loud kind of crunch noise as it flips forward again inadequate knee friction is the common cause there and uneven step length this can be from pain discomfort uh, contractures all sorts of difficulty there okay so some considerations when you're dealing with uh, someone with a transtibial transfemoral any sort of amputation you want to prevent contracture so this is something that after someone's had a transtibial amputation, please make sure that you keep that knee in full extension while they're at rest. Otherwise, they'll get a knee flexion contracture, which is super bad news. Prevent skin breakdown. Always monitor the skin. Make sure that you're not overdoing it on the skin. Make sure it's not moist. Make sure, yeah, just make sure your skin is has good integrity. Uh, let's see, gait suspension training devices. You may choose to have the person in a harness while they're practicing their gait. Again, that just is providing a little bit of safety. Make sure you're using the appropriate assistive device. So starting more stable with walker, we talked about that, and moving to less stable with a cane, it's kind of a spectrum. And then recognize that all prostheses have a higher energy cost than normal anatomical gait. That's the idea there. So there you go, prosthetics in a nutshell. Uh, Coming up next, we'll be talking about orthotics and other equipment and devices. Lots of fun. Hey guys, this is Will with PT Final Exam. Hope you enjoyed that video. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share with your friends. Check out all the other awesome videos we have here on YouTube or head over to ptfinalexam.com. Find lots of other great resources as you prepare for the NPT. So remember, this is the web's most awesome way to prepare for the NPT. Will Crane fist pumps all around. Thanks, guys.